So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are <laughs> in the world. I'm Alex Kunze, a Global Program and Partnership Officer here at the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I wanted to thank you for joining us today. Welcome to another webinar in our series of Words Matter. This series explores the importance of using proper child protection terminology in preventing, addressing, and responding to child sexual exploitation and abuse. Today's session is titled, Choosing Words Carefully When Speaking To and About Children, and will explore the power of words to influence our beliefs and actions around child sexual exploitation and human trafficking, as well as how to avoid bias and respond to overt discrimination when dealing with these issues. Today's presentation will be delivered by Dr. Jordan Greenbaum, her experience and subject matter expertise is a result of her more than 20 years working with suspected victims of child sexual and physical abuse, sexual exploitation, and trafficking. She now trains locally, nationally, and internationally to help professionals such as yourselves prevent, identify, and intervene in cases of suspected abuse and trafficking. Just so that you are all aware, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on ICMEC's YouTube channel shortly after this live event. We will also have time for questions after the presentation, so please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A, and we will get to these at the end. Um, so now I will hand it over to Dr. Jordan. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for attending um, today, tonight, uh, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I'm looking forward to having uh, an interactive next hour with you. And I really hope that you will feel free to use the chat box or even ask to be unmuted, whatever we can do to, in, to encourage a conversation, because I'm bringing up a lot of questions um, and, I, and I would like to get your feedback. Um, you will help educate me and I'm hoping I can share some information in return. So um, as Alex alluded to, we're gonna talk about um, the power of words uh, to influence our minds and our opinions, our actions, and how that can be extremely subtle. Um, and we are not necessarily aware of, of the influence. Um, and then we're gonna ask ourselves and each other, whose perspective should we consider when we think about things like, quote, the best interest of the child? Whose perspective should we be considering here? Um, how do we respond to overt discrimination when we encounter it in the workplace or in our own personal lives? Uh, and then finally, I want to extend this discussion about um, uh, word choice to written words, because a lot of us as professionals keep records. Uh, and uh, the way we, we phrase things and what we include in records can be very powerful and very influential in a child's lives. So we need to sort of think about that. And I'd like to hear your opinions about that. So um, if you attended the first uh, Words Matter uh, webinar, I thought um, uh, Dr. Simone did a great job uh, on this. And she talked about um, the importance of words and in influencing um, our reasoning uh, and our opinions and our actions. Um, and so for example, she brought up this study by, it's Thibodeau, and I can't remember the other author, but it was the study that they looked at um, how metaphor uh, influences people's opinions uh, in the context of um, viewing crime. So this is what they did. Um, they took two sets of individuals um, and they gave them a, a fictional scenario. That's this town called Addison um, has a certain amount of crime going on. And um, to one of the groups, they, they use the uh, a metaphor of um, a, a beast preying on Addison and the, as representing the crime that was preying on the city. And on the other, with the other group, they use more of a, a virus is infecting the city. Uh, and then they said, um, you know, what, what do you think the city's response should be? And the people who had been exposed to the beast metaphor um, responded much more punitively. This is what should be done uh, to regain control. Uh, whereas the other group uh, who had been, um, the, used the, the virus metaphor and more, had more of a reformative approach. And when they asked people, well, so why do you say that, why do you respond that way? None of them mentioned the metaphor, of course, they weren't aware of the influence of the metaphor, um, but they cited the various statistics, which were both the same for each group, um, and, and sort of the facts and stuff that were that that didn't vary between the groups, not really realizing the impact of the way things were phrased with that metaphor. And I think 
um, it really speaks to how it can be very subtle um, and unconscious, how words that are used and when we read, when we write, when we speak with each other can really be influential in how we form our own opinions and, and then act on those opinions. So um, when we talk about the negative power of words and we're talking about child sexual exploitation or trafficking, I think uh, this comes to the forefront very quickly. Um, too often we hear the public, but also other professionals using the word prostitute. I hear that all the time still. Uh, the child was a prostitute. Oh, those children uh, were prostituting. Uh, and that has a very negative uh, connotation, a lot of stigma for thousands of years that words a word has had a lot of negative stigma. Uh, a child selling sex, and I've seen that in, um, I'm a medical professional, I've seen that in medical records uh, as uh, this child who has a history of selling sex, uh, which sort of implies this is her, um, you know, her ultimate career goal, this is her decision to do it. Child porn, and we know, has, an, has a negative connotation in their efforts to go, get away from use that term. When we look at some of the children who are vulnerable to exploitation and trafficking, many of those are homeless or street-based um, children. And the term street kid or homeless kid um, carries its own negative connotation, which you might think about in your head, how uh, what we associate with the homeless um, and uh, uh, a street child. Uh, and then uh, migrants who don't have the appropriate documentation for residents in the United States are called undocumented or even alien, um, which is uh, very negative. Uh, so I think this is very pervasive in our discussions about children who are at risk and vulnerable to exploitation and trafficking. Um, and we often choose uh, our words in a way that ends up to be very much victim blaming. And um, I've had the good fortune to be able to work in a lot of different cultures. And one thing that seems universal to me uh, in uh, society's response to child sexual abuse, exploitation and trafficking is this constant victim blaming um, uh, within the society, within the professionals who are dealing with the children. Uh, victim blaming is very prominent. So you might hear things like, well, have you ever gotten into this situation before in response to a child, for example, being the victim of a physical assault or uh, sex trafficking? Have you ever gotten into the situation before, which carries the meaning of what did you do to get yourself in trouble? Um, and the same thing with what did you do to make that happen? Um, or talking about another child, he needs to stop running away from home and trading sex for money as if this is something the child could just decide not to do, like they're not going to have an apple for lunch, they would have something else, and sort of implying the child has complete agency and it's their fault for whatever happens to them. Uh, and then finally, she sent a sexy photo to a stranger, now it's on the internet, um, I can't read it. I can't even see the last part of that slide, but you can read it, also very much victim blaming. Um, uh, so I think this comes up consciously and unconsciously, um, more uh, overt and more subtle uh, in, in the way that we see things, which has a, a very big influence on how we react uh, and whether we're, off, whether we're willing to see a child as needing services or whether we want to criminalize them um, and what our priorities are when we respond to them. Um, very much um, in the recent past, you and me and all of us have become very much aware of this victim blaming attitude. And we've tried our best not to do that, to sort of swerve away from that. But I fear that in some ways, in some cases, we've gone to the other extreme. Uh, and in our, in our effort to get away from victim blaming, our response has become sort of the other extreme of this is something that has happened to you. You had no control. This was not your fault. This happened to you. The world acts on you. You are just a beach ball and it gets kicked around um, and you have no control over the situation. Um, there's nothing you could have done, um, which is maybe, and I fear, is interpreted by children, especially adolescents, um, to mean that what we're saying to them is you are too stupid to be able to or incapable of um, responding to your environment, analyzing a situation, responding appropriately. You don't have the capacity to do that. You can't take care of yourself, um, which is very much patronizing um, and um, 
uh, infantilizing. And so I worry about that, that there you know, are efforts to say, this is not your fault. While at one level is completely true, no one deserves to be exploited. No one deserves to be treated badly. The child has all the child rights outlined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I absolutely believe that. But I also fear that children are seeing these messages in a way that we don't intend, an unintended consequence. Um, and it also, you know, they may be interpreting it as us telling them, we're adults and we know what's best for you. Because you're a child, you're so easily manipulated, you have no way of knowing what reality is. Um, and your trafficker's an evil person while you are a helpless child who can't protect themselves. And all of these are very, very infantilizing. And it makes me um, wonder two things. Um, whether the child, we have to ask ourselves, are we correct in that? What are, what are we basing our beliefs on? We decide in our minds that we know what's best for the child, but are our assumptions about what is best for a child actually realistic? For example, if we say to ourselves, the solution for this child who is um, has run away from a, an abusive situation, the home is out on the street, is being exploited, um, is the appropriate solution to put them back into their home, get them back in school, plug in a few uh, wraparound services, and they'll be okay. Or um, this uh, unaccompanied minor who is at high risk of being uh, trafficked, well, we put them, make sure they're in school, um, and everything will be okay because they have a sponsor and they're in at school. Do we realize what in these situations school actually means? Is it realistic? Do we think it's a leave it to beaver like situation that they're having a very good welcoming teacher who is very trauma informed um, and knows all about how to um, work with children who don't speak the language or children who have been deeply traumatized at home and who provides a lot of support and the uh, peers in the classroom are all very welcoming. There's no violence or bullying or anything uh, and that the resources in the school are gonna give the child a truly good education. That may be our expectation, but is that this child's reality? And do we give the child a chance to really tell us about their experiences so we see their reality? It may be that some of their experiences are important for us and we are not aware of and would change our view of what's in the best interest of the child if we knew about them. Um, and so I think, think that we need to sit back and learn from the child, see their perspective and say, hmm, okay, in this particular situation, what might be the best way for, to help this child? And um, are they making, is their decision truly, quote, ill-informed, or are they making the best decision from a, a series of extremely difficult options, none of which includes the option we think they should have taken, which is to go to a, um, a um, live in a house with a white picket fence and go to uh, the grammar school that uh, everybody dreams about as American education. So I think that there, there are implications for our response, the way children are seeing it, and what our own wording is sort of implying about our own beliefs. So are we empowering or infantilizing? When we say to the child, this is not your fault, this is the trauma, this happened to you, um, uh, you had no control, what are we, how are they interpreting it? Are they feeling empowered or not? Are we respecting them or patronizing them? And I think while we're having this sort of come to Jesus talk with ourselves and trying to um, listen more to the child, we also have to tackle the very difficult problem of what is, how do we take into account the child's level of brain development and maturity? Certainly a child who is 15 or nine or 17 doesn't have the executive functioning power that a 35 year old does. Um, they are, don't have the power for insight, for delaying gratification, for seeing, weighing the risks and the benefits, for saying, let's see, if I send a sexual photo to this person, what might be the unintended consequences here? Or does this person who professes to love me really do that, show me that in every way? Are, there, are they really looking after my best interest? They don't necessarily have the ability to hash that out. So how do we listen to them, give them the agency that they need, yet also remember that perhaps their views are not the same views they themselves would have in 10 years when their brain is more developed. How can we do that? And I don't say that I have the answers. I think that, but it is something that we need to be thinking about listening to. 
um, and um, very carefully wording how we express things. And I think the choice of words should be dependent on context. For example, um, if you have a 15 year old boy um, and he's living on the streets and he exchanges sex acts uh, for money or for um, his food or for a place to stay, um, think about that. Put, put yourself uh, as a case manager in that position. You're speaking with a police officer who you suspect in your conversation with him or her sees the teen as a criminal. How would you choose your, your words as you, as you sort of advocate for the child and what the child might need? And how would that differ, differ when you're talking to the child who considers himself um, capable of making a decision and actually as the, um, in a sense, exploiting others, that he is in control um, and um, is doing what he sees is best for himself? How would we phrase that? Well, I think that if I were uh, in that position, I would probably um, sensing that the police officer may see this child as an adult criminal who needs to be um, punished, I would tend to word my phrasing uh, as making the child seem vulnerable, emphasizing the child as a victim who has had things happen to them, who needs services. Um, rather than as what I would say with a child, which I would be very much more listening to their perspective, looking and listening to their perspective as being in control um, and not emphasizing that the child has um, is being exploited by others, but instead looking at their point of view, seeing the world from their point of view. So I think that we need to, for each case, whenever we talk to children, we need to acknowledge the extreme complexity of any child's life, the nuances of how we speak about things and how they may interpret them. And then we need to look at ourselves and say, okay, why did I use the words that I was going to use? What does that imply about my own beliefs? And are my own beliefs realistic? Am I right? Uh, if the child sees things differently, whose reality is real? Their reality? My reality? Neither reality? Somewhere in between? We need to treat each situation individually, be uh, very well aware of the child's perspective so that we can listen to their experiences, listen to the, their perspectives, and perhaps that will change our own expect, expect, uh, perspectives. And then we need to be aware of possible stigma, um, uh, words that blame or disempower in our genuine efforts to empower children. Are we instead disempowering them? Um, before I move on to the next uh, topic, I'd like to open it up uh, for any questions or comments at this. I think this is really sort of deep stuff, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this. Or uh, read your thoughts on this, if you would like to, like to be uh, write something in the chat box. Hi, Jordan. So we have one question so Yay. far. Um, that's, you know, how, you know, in the case of... Um, the teenage boy and the police officer that you were just describing, how do you balance those two points of view if you are in the same room with both of them? Because like you said, one, you know, you're coming, you're trying to balance these very different um, views of the boy's behavior and of his um, vulnerabilities as well, yeah. as well as trying to, you know, get him comfortable asking for the services that he may need. Yeah, that how, is. How would you go about balancing that? Thank you. That is such an insightful question. And it's a very real one because sometimes we're all in the same room. I think, and I would love to hear what other people think. I think what I would do is I would emphasize the child's perspective as I, I would acknowledge the child's perspective and, but emphasize that the child is working um, with very difficult circumstances and that he or she, or in this case, he needs help, uh, that he has very few options. This is the way he's tried to help himself. We need, as a response, need to help him with other options to help himself. He hasn't had access. To services. So we need to give him those services so he doesn't need to resort to um, making the uh, continuing to do what he has decided to do. And I'm not criticizing his decision to do it. I'm saying we need to give him other options. Uh, and I, I'm uh, interested to hear what other people would do. Great. I think that that's, you know, I think that's really insightful because it's, it is so infrequent that you know, you're only speaking to one or the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's see, we have another question here from Sean. Um, and it says, what I found by trial and error in out outpatient gen pediatrics, 
um, was that talking with and to the young adult to ask questions, to learn, lecturing and talking to the parent about the child was often off-putting and ineffective. Hooray, I totally agree. Thumbs up three times. That was, yes, I absolutely agree. We have, listening is better than talking and certainly giving advice uh, is not what any adolescent has ever welcomed that I've ever met. Um, uh, so I absolutely agree, getting their perspective, asking them questions and listening, um, giving them the respect, not just talking to the parent. Uh, yes, thank you. And we have another question. Hmm. What words are appropriate when talking with elders of the child? Because in many countries, it is considered that that child is inherently responsible, like CSAM. Yeah, I guess I would um, uh, take the same sort of general approach with anyone that I would try to ask questions and learn more about what their perspective is, what their cultural views are, what their individual views are, and why they feel that way. And then, you know, get a thorough understanding through a lot of open-ended questions to find out why they feel the way they do um, about the child's role and their agency. And then, um, then sort of gradually sort of almost like a motivational interviewing, sort of look, uh, talk about other, sort of bring in other factors that may um, be important that, you know, the child has had decreased options, that, um, you know, there, there are these things in this child's life, would that make a difference to you in your, in your thoughts? And, and I might even say, you know, there are other ways to, to, to see this. Um, I'm thinking of another way of, of looking at it. Can I share that with you? And that person can say no or yes. And if they say yes, it's, well, sometimes when I talk to people, people feel, have a different way of looking at children. They see da, 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 and you sort of bring in this other alternative option. What do you think about that? And they may say, oh, that's just ridiculous. And then you can say, tell me more about that. So I'm sort of trying to um, listen thoroughly to their perspective, find some common ground and introduce the idea of an alternative way of thinking of things, or at least sort of bring in um, factors that, that may lead the elder to question their beliefs in this situation with this child. Granted, you know, there may be a cultural belief about the child's role in general, but is there specific uh, factors going on in this child's life that may lead you to treat this child differently? And I would, you know, sort of ask the, the elder that um, so that I'm sort of getting them to see the pros and the cons and the other options uh, and that this is a very nuanced thing. Um, again, other thoughts yeah. on uh, how people would react is, is very welcome. We have several more questions. Yay. Um, so how would you approach a teenager who doesn't sleep at home in these situations? So a child who is homeless. I would um, be, again, I try to listen more than speak, find out um, their, about their life. I'd tell, tell me as much as you feel comfortable about the last time or your current situation, last week if you're homeless now or the last time you ran away get a sense of what's going on with them. Uh, ask a lot of open-ended questions to figure out um, what services they may need, what harm reduction strategies may be appropriate, and also to assess the level of risk of whether I need to make a mandatory report. So I would, um, but listen more than um, talk and any suggestions I had, I would ask permission to say, you know, I, I might get to the end of the, the conversation, finding out all about what's going on, the challenges they've they've had and that they've been selling sex and say, you know, that sounds like you have a very, very hard, have hard time with this. And I, you know, I work with children who who are, are similarly going through a lot. Um, it's very, very difficult. Um, what do you think would be best for you? What would make things better? Or, you know, we've been talking a lot. Um, I have some ideas. You've shared so much about yourself you're, and you're such an expert on yourself. I have a few ideas and thoughts I'd like to share with you about what might be helpful. And you can, you know, they may or may not be helpful. Would it be okay if I shared some ideas? Yes, they're going to say yes, because that's a nice thing to say. They'll say yes. And then you can trot out your recommendations and they can say, no, that's, you know, I've been to that runaway shelter. It doesn't, it's lousy or good or um, and you can go from there. That's the way I would do it. Yeah, I think that the, you know, the idea of that verbal consent is is so important. Yeah. Um, and speaking of, uh, one of our next questions is in developing countries, it is considered, you know, a stigma 
um, for a child to be undergoing these experiences, what are the best ways to bring the child out of this stigma and make them feel comfortable? Uh, and I'm assuming that you're referring to as you're talking to the child, not the surrounding community, but talking to the child. Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm, I'd love to hear from other people. The way I would, I guess I would just do the same thing, find out, start from a period, a, a position of curiosity. Why, what is the stigma? Why do they see it that way? How do they feel? How do others around them feel? How does it make them feel? And then say, um, and, and not say, you know, you don't need to feel that way. You shouldn't feel that way. And sort of impose our own cultural views on things. But instead say, um, acknowledge their feelings about that, explore that. And then you might say, among other things, you know, they're, um, I come from a different perspective. I sort of see things a little bit differently. Um, and I'm really glad you shared the way you see things. It's really been helpful for me. Um, because from my perspective, I see things differently. Um, can I just share with you what I, the way I see it? And then I would share the sort of the non-stigmatizing part of it, that this, um, yes, you've had difficult experiences. This is not your whole life. Um, you, you know, this is not you. There's much more to you than um, what these past experiences, and, you know, kind of go on with the empowerment um, type, type of discussion and the destigmatizing, but only with their permission and acknowledging their certain absolute right to see themselves in a stigmatized way, but sort of opening the door to seeing a different way of viewing themselves. Yeah. And, you know, I, as you were talking about that, I was thinking of the broad range of circumstances that that applies to it. You know, it applies to instances of CSAM online, sexual yeah. abuse, trafficking, um, children who are living on the streets, um, all of those different cases. It seems yeah. like that is sort of an encompassing strategy for yeah. all of those different types of issues. Yeah. I would, um, I, I probably need to move on, um, but if there, can we try to get, finish this up as soon as possible and we can get to the end and have more questions because I love this exchange. I'm learning a lot. So that sounds great. Okay. The next thing I want to challenge you to is um, how do you, how do I, how do we respond when we witness overt discrimination? And I'm thinking mostly in our workplace, but it could be in a public place too, but let's just say it's in our workplace. Um, so, for example, put yourself in this position. You've been asked to conduct an assessment and design a safety plan for a 14-year-old transgender female who was sexually assaulted the night prior. The assault occurred near a park in an area of town known for commercial sex and drug sales. You overhear one staff member say to another, if he, or should I say she, hadn't made such bad decisions, they wouldn't be in that situation, living that life. What do you expect? What would you do? Please feel free to share in the chat. What on earth would you do with this situation? Or um, is there any way, uh, Alice, can we unmute people or is that not possible? Um, let me see. Oh, somebody's got their hand up. Yay. <laughs> yep. uh, and you can unmute yourself to ask your question or give your response. I think that our your volume is having trouble. I wonder if it's the internet connection. Oh, yeah, I think it is. Um, would you be able to type in the chat box? Maybe that would help because it seems like the connection is bad. Has anyone else thought about what, uh, come up with an idea? That's a tough one. Would you just, uh, Continue on with your work and say, geez, that person is misinformed. What adult? Uh, but then leave it at that. Would you? Um, criticize that person right away in front of everybody? Or 
would you try to talk to the person alone and then give your point of view? What would you? Let's see, we have a response in the Q&A. Um, Drecky Smith says, I would immediately intervene and have a private conversation with the person. Jackie, I think that's a great idea to not stand by. We cannot be silent bystanders, um, but not to humiliate the person in front of everybody else because I'll just make them defensive. So having a private conversation, I think, is a great idea. Um, and Sean Singleton says, you know, call out privately, ask more questions about their understanding of the situation. Yeah, absolutely, Sean. You want to understand where they're coming from, uh, why they why they feel that way, and that sort of forces them to question themselves too. It, you know, that might just have blurted out from a kind of a subconscious total bias. And you're saying, pay attention to why you're why you said that, and sort of forcing them to look at themselves. So I I, I like that idea. And you're not coming, you're not criticizing them. I mean, you you're opening yourself up to hearing more about them before you come with your view. Um, we have several other responses. Says, says, we do not criticize in front of the person. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Ruth says, this should be escalated to management. You can't bystand. It shows a need for training. Yeah, good, good point, good point. And Adam says, as long as it is of sound, as long as it is out of sound of the victim, I would leave it alone just because they have that opinion does not mean that they will treat the victim like that. This that's possible. Yeah, that's possible. And it may be that this person is not going to interact with the victim at all. But it does make for a toxic environment. Uh, if if the environment is such that this is allowed to go to be said, I think it would be it says something about the tolerance. Um, of bias and discrimination within the environment. So I would feel like something needs to be done about this, not in the presence of everybody else, condemning that person in front of everybody else would be fruitless and not a nice thing to do. Um, but I do think that something should be done. Um, uh, perhaps certainly, um, you know, escalating it, but um, talking to the person in private. And this is just, uh, this next slide is just an example and it's not the thing to do at all. But I might say something like, you know, getting the person aside, and, and I love, uh, was it Sean who said asking them more about their uh, their thoughts on it is really good. Um, but you also might say, you know, I overheard you talking about our client. It made me, it, it, you're focusing on myself, it made me very uncomfortable. I think this child needs our help and support, not our blame and judgment. We really don't have any idea w what she's been through in her life or how uh, we would react to the trauma that she's experienced. You know, we all have our own biases. I get that, our own feelings, but we can't let them interfere with providing compassionate care. You know, I've seen you be very respectful and empowering with clients. Doesn't this one deserve the same treatment? Something like that, where you're saying, it makes me uncomfortable um, and this is why. You are a good person. You know, you're a good staff member. You're not a creep. Um, but I, I think he got it wrong in this one. You know, and I, I think we need to be, be compassionate on this one. Um, that is just one option. Um, and I like, but I especially like the idea of learning more about sort of forcing them to look at themselves and why they responded the way they did. So uh, the next thing is, well, so what implicit or explicit biases do we have? Ooh. So think about these. I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. I'm not going to ask for any responses. Just silently check your mind. Lenita is a 16-year-old girl who came to your country six months ago as an unaccompanied minor. Make up whatever country she came from. doesn't matter. She lives with an, quote, uncle uh, who allows his friends to have sex with her as a way to pay for rent. Or Joseph is a teen who lives with a violent father and substance misusing mother. He's been in trouble at school and with the police. Rumor has it now that he runs a sex ring at school, exploiting younger students. What is your immediate gut reaction about Joseph? Or Sophia has a boyfriend in a gang. She's made to sell sex at a local motel as part of her affiliation with the gang. She also must sell drugs to her, quote, clients. What do you think about so Sophia, who wants so desperately to be in this gang? I think we need to think about what does our gut react and how can we control that? What do we do to control our biases? We not, may not be able to change our biases very easily, 
We may have the same gut reactions, but we need to question them uh, and control them and manage them, make sure that they don't affect the way we um, uh, treat others. And I'm wondering, do people have ideas? How would you control your biases? How do you do it now? Feel free to send your answers into the Q&A box. And you don't need to uh, tell anyone your biases, but how everybody has them. So how do you control it? Um, one person responded that you need a safe space mm -hmm. uh, in order to challenge them within yourself. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, another said... The first step is to acknowledge them and see them. Make the implicit more conscious. Mm -hmm. So you could combine those saying, yeah, the first step is to recognize what my bias is and then to give myself permission. I have this bias and I need to work on it and see and challenge it. Not condemn myself for having the bias, but instead give myself permission to challenge it and change it. Another person said, at the core, we are all people, people with value. How would I want to be treated if the roles were reversed? Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I think that's a good a good thing to ask, ask myself. You know, so if I had a, if my views of Sophia were, well, any person who belongs to a gang deserves to be, um, you know, ostracized from the whole world. Um, I think a good thing would be to, to say exactly that, how would I want to be treated? Would I want to be treated that way? Or is there another way to look at this? Are all people who are members of gangs doing this because they want to do it and they're um, uh, you know, a, a, a horrible people? Or are there other ways to look at, interpret this? Um, so yeah, other thoughts? Uh, we have several more. Um, mm -hmm. Remembering that my role is to help, not judge, not yep. force my own morals in quotes on others. Yes, yes. Um, and then it's important to explore them and never ignore them. Mm -hmm. However, it's good to question them and how productive they would be in supporting someone. Yeah, good. Oh, I like that. Yeah, how is this going to help the situation that I have this bias against gangs uh membership when i talked to sophia how's that could that possibly help the situation uh, and finally we need to be intentional about demonstrating authentic empathy yeah you guys these are wonderful i am learning so much and i really appreciate your insights on this so good so um the last thing i want to cover before just sort of opening it up again um is how we choose our written words uh, and this became very important to me as a um physician uh, working with children who have been abused exploited and trafficked and and writing documenting in the medical record which is not necessarily confidential um and so it and, I, and it made me really question um choices of words and so it, it come up with some questions that I thought are sort of helpful for child serving professionals, not just medical professionals. We're not the only ones who document, but we need to think about how does our organization protect our clients' privacy and confidentiality? How do they do that? What kind of um, computer um, uh, based uh, safety issues uh, uh, come up and, and what kind of protection mechanisms are in place and how good are they? Who has access to our client records? Now we may say to our client, oh, this is, you know, it's only uh, within our organization, but can other people within the organization go to that chart, pull it up and look at it? If it's, can your chart be subpoenaed? Can your records be subpoenaed? And then who has access to it? How does your client feel about sharing sensitive information? What I think sensitive may not be what the child thinks is sensitive. They may think something else is sensitive. And how do they feel about other people seeing it and hearing it and, re and reading it? Um, do they understand the limits of confidentiality? I hear a lot of people saying, a lot of uh, healthcare providers saying, where this is a confidential conversation. But actually, uh, when it all comes down to it, subpoenas uh, can 
rip right into confidentiality. Um, and it's, it's, I cannot guarantee that the patient, what the patient tells me will not be, um, if I write it in my medical record, that it will not be heard or read by somebody else because I don't have necessarily have full control. So we need to be aware of that and ask ourselves, do we actually know the answers to these questions? Uh, there are a lot of pros and cons. When you're trying to decide what to write in your records, you've had this very deep conversation with the child. What are you going to write? What are you going to document? The pros of, of you know, documenting sensitive information are, well, it helps the, um, that should be continuity of care rather than community of care. Uh, it helps people around us and, and who are coming after us know what the issues are so that they can provide optimal care down the road. Uh, it, is, it assists a child in obtaining resources um, because if we know we document what they need, we can uh, others can help us get the resources. In some cases, uh, documenting something like uh, the child is um, uh, experiencing trafficking, suspect trafficker, uh, accompanied child to the appointment today or to the emergency department, that can help as, as can be critical in the safety of a patient and staff. Um, it can direct uh, resource allocation within the community at a broader community scale statistics, you know, where um, uh, getting sense of information may at a, at a very anonymized epidemiologic level help drive resources to a needy community. Uh, but the harms may be that if a trafficker ever gains access to these records and potentially to a medical record, they may um, harm the, the, uh, the, the patient. Um, there may be stigma, bias, and discrimination by staff. Are we saying that no one but you as a staff member are seeing what's in your record and no one else in your organization is seeing that? In many cases, that's not true. Other people can see it and they may develop a stigmatized, biased reaction to that, to that client. And the inherent shame and humiliation that the child may feel with whatever the sensitive information is, it's sensitive for a reason, whether they're HIV positive, whether they are, um, uh, they, uh, are uh, of LGBTQ status, whether they are using substances and they don't want other people to know, they have feelings about that, and that may be something they feel ashamed about. So these are sort of the pros and cons of documenting sensitive information. So how do we, what should we do in these situations? Well, I think re relying on trauma-informed care and some of those basic tenets can be very helpful. Respecting the child's right to have privacy and confidentiality and to know the limits of that confidentiality, looking out for their psychological and their physical safety, getting their informed consent, telling them who's going to have access to these records, what is going to be documented, discussing that with the child. So that they know before they start to give you information, what may be completely private and what is not. How far can this information go? Empowering them to know about the limits of confidentiality and make their own decisions about what to reveal. So for example, uh, in uh, the healthcare situation, I might say something like this. You know, usually I, I, I talk to my, um, we, I talk with my patients a lot about uh, their health and then what's going on in their lives. And I include much of what we talk about in your health record so that I can go back later or other healthcare providers, your pediatrician, for example, can go back and know what's going on and they can best care for you in the future. Or in case in the future, you need this information, you have access to it because it's in a record and you can go back and get it. Um, but it includes sensitive information if it's relevant to your health. And so while here at the clinic, whatever, wherever I am, we do our best to keep records confidential so that only staff who need to know to help to care for you, only those staff have access. There are certain circumstances where others may gain access to your record. So I can't guarantee that no one else will ever see your record. I just can't. Uh, so there's something sensitive you'd like to tell me, but you don't want it in your record. We can talk about that. Now I've just said a whole lot. Do you understand basically what I said? Do you have any questions about that? Because I'm glad to go over it again. So you're essentially saying, beware. I can't guarantee total confidentiality about what we're going to say. So if you want to tell me, please tell me, but let's talk about it. Um, so that, you know, it may need to get diagnosed, may not, let's talk about it. So just so you know, and then the child may decide, okay, I'm going to talk about some things, but I'm withhold other things. That is their right. And we need to give it to them. 
And at the end of the, of the conversation, once they've shared what they've shared, I might remind them and say, you know, we've talked a lot of really important things um, that I, I really appreciate because much of what you talked about can be, can really affect your health now and in the future. Is there anything that we've discussed that you do not want documented in your health record? And so they may say, yeah, yeah, actually, nothing about the drugs or the sex. Hmm. Now, I, as a healthcare provider, am really concerned about their considerable substance use and the fact that they are having uh, more than 10 or 15 sexual partners. That's a big health, the, both of those are big health concerns. And those, in my mind, are really important to document. So what am I going to do about that? Well, the first thing I would do is acknowledge that. Okay, um, can you tell me more? I want to know more about that. What is it about that? Why is it that you don't want it to document? Can you can you talk to me to Help me understand that. And so we explore their concerns and then look at the options. Is there any way to come to a compromise on this so that I get the child's health needs met, they get their privacy needs met? And there may be a few solutions. I can stay very general in my documentation uh, so that some things are sort of implied that a healthcare provider may pick up on but anyone else accessing the record may not. Sometimes that involves using abbreviations that are very common within the healthcare provider world, but not understood by the average um, non-medical person reading a record. You know, we discussed certain adolescent health issues in the, this is a very well-recognized head screen, and the screen was positive for DNS1. That means nothing to anybody unless you know what the head screen stands for and what DNS1 are. If you do, you know there are issues about drugs and um, uh, sexual um, uh, issues. So then going on to say resources or discussed follow-up. The next pediatrician down the line is gonna say, oh, okay, I, I got it, I'm gonna follow up on that. Um, but anyone else seeing that is gonna say, oh, I don't know what that is and just go on. Or if you feel like, depending on the situation, whatever you're talking to the child about, you feel like, okay, maybe I don't actually need to document them. That would be another option, but you have to make sure. I'm not saying you don't document if it's in the child's um, best interest, you know, health and well-being wise that it's documented. Uh, you have to document it, but um, there are maybe other options. So just to conclude and open it back up for discussion, um, choosing our words is heavily dependent on context and is often very nuanced. Uh, and it has implications for what we ourselves are believing and communicating between the lines and the way the child is gonna interpret that in, and in uh, between the lines. We need to be aware of multiple perspectives, our own and the child's uh, and the possible interpretations and the possible meanings. And we need to actively question ourselves and ask the child to explain their perspective so that we learn our, we have self-knowledge and knowledge about the child. Uh, active bystander intervention is very important. We just cannot allow a toxic environment to go unaddressed uh, because that'll essentially say, it's okay to have biases and discrimination that is overt. Um, in this environment. And, and I don't think anyone wants that. Uh, word choice is also a key in written documentation. And for the past few years, I've been much more aware of the need to be very conscious about how we phrase things. So I'd like to um, just talk about a little bit, and this is, I think, downloadable, uh, Alex, I think hopefully a PDF can be downloadable, but there are some resources at the uh, ICMIC Health Portal uh, that address some of these issues, talking uh, to kids using a rights-based approach, um, documenting other sensitive information in electronic medical records, which is very health uh, directed, but I think is of use a lot of these sort of practice suggested ways of phrasing things may be of use to people who are working with children outside the health sector, say in social welfare or victim advocacy or um, uh, legal uh, modes. Thank you. Um, I hope that you will continue now to give me your input and give others your insights, um, but also reach out in the future because I learn so much from the people I work with and I'm working with you. So teach me. <laughs> I'm going to give just a second if you want to take a picture of this photo or this slide and then we'll I'll stop sharing we can please uh, start writing in things in the chat box or the Q&A share with your thoughts.
Thank you, Jordan. Um, I just put the link in the chat so everybody should be able to click through oh, straight good. to the health portal and okay. access those resources. We do have one last question. Yay. Um, if others have them, please add them to the Q&A box. Um, so what examples can you mention of good practices that fostered the agency of adolescents and young people who experienced sexual exploitation? Mm -hmm. um, I think the things that, that help um, sort of emphasize self-agency um, and you know, the strengths is saying what, asking a lot of questions it essentially gives them the respect that, that I value their opinion and that they are the experts on themselves. And so I, then I might say, you are the expert on themselves. Tell me about what you've been seeing and why you've been seeing it that way. And then I would say, what do you think is that would work best for you? What do you think about this? And I would always ask them their opinion first and then say, I, you know, I'm, I have a, a couple of thoughts. Can I share those with you? Asking permission, asking if for their opinion, um, asking um, why they, um, might decide to do X instead of Y, say, what would make you decide to stay in the park at night rather than going to a shelter? I'd, I'd like to learn more about what drives that decision. So in a non-judgmental way, but you're saying, I respect your decision. I just want to understand where it came from. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear others. Uh, it's a really good question. So if others have thoughts on that, please, please jump in. I hope that answered your question. If not, tell me and I'll try again. You can also say, you know, you've been through some very, very difficult times. And I am so impressed with the way you have gotten through those difficult times. I am not sure what I would have done in your situation. Um, can you tell me just some of the things that you, you figured as ways to, you know, what have you called on? during those times when you're really under a lot of pressure, you're in a bad situation, somehow you got through it. What inner strength did you call on to get you through that? How'd you come up with the idea of saying this and getting out of that? You know, I don't think I would have come up with that. That's just amazing. You know, what drove that? And you're, you're saying, wow, you do have a lot of smarts. Teach me about it. I want to know. Um, I think you're muted, Alice. You are right. I was just saying thank you. I think that um, that's very insightful and a really great note for us to end on today. Um, so thank you all for your participation. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Jordan, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we will follow up to everybody with an email, which will include links and additional helpful resources, such as our health portal um, and the recording to this session. Thank you again. And we will end today's session now and have a great rest of your week. Can I um, send you the PDF, Alex? Can we make that available as well or no? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Thanks, okay. everybody. And thanks so much for your insight. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>